the rise of digital ID, so many questions about what's changing, how um, we can ride that wave and be on the early end as we see some tremendous change for how we share our identity, perhaps our payment as well, um, but our entire identity online. Um, we'll have Joe Alanya from IT.com, Rachel Sterling, CMO at Identity Digital, and Chad Folkney will be moderating. And I, any question Chad wants answered, I, I want answered if I can understand it. So thanks for making it accessible to us. Uh, welcome, everybody. Our panel is the rise of the digital identity game changer for the entire domain industry. It's been changed, hasn't it? No, it's been like that the whole time. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm Chad Fulkman. I guess I'm the moderator today. Uh, we're going to have a good discussion, have questions at the end. Um, we're just going to talk about digital identity uh, and domains and how it kind of affects all of us and stuff. So, start with some intros, a couple questions. Uh, we're going to have some fun with it. So, start with, with Rachel. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Sterling. I am a big tech refugee, and I'm now in the safe space of domaining. Um, I spent 15 years working at Google, Meta, and Instagram, uh, and Twitter, and now I am here at Identity Digital, working on raising awareness for descriptive domains. So I'm super excited to be at my first domains conference. My name is Joe Alanya, I'm uh, with IT.com. Uh, I've been a domain name advocate, lover, player, in all different realms with registries, registrars for about 20 years. And uh, I, you know, I just think domain names have a lot of value. They're great tools for so many things. And of course, one of them being digital identities. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Chad Folketing. Uh, I've been in the space for 27 years now, full time. Uh, love domains, obviously, all domains. Um, running a company called Realty DAO, it's a digital marketplace, uh, digital tokenized marketplace for domains, and then contrib anybody can contribute to those tokenized assets. Um, we have about 22,000 domain names, and uh, we think that they're a very, very still unutilized asset, and there's a lot of potential uh, left. So um, let's get into it. Like, what what is digital? What is digital ID? Let's start with that. So we all live our lives online right now. Um, your digital ID is the representation of who you are. As a Where are we getting? Okay. What I'm saying is so scandalous. It's generating <laughs> feedback. <laughs> um, and so when we start thinking about digital ID, this is our calling card. This is the new business card. And we want to make sure that we have parity across all different platforms, whether it's from social to our website to the way that people pay us. And so it's crucial that people, not just businesses, but individuals invest in digital IDs so that they do get to that parity across all platforms. Yeah, I would like to say it's working. Is it working? Yep. Um, I think there's a, a tremendous need for um, digital better digital identity uh, tools. Um, I spent a little time, I'm also a licensed insurance broker, so uh, over the last year and a half, uh, I, I, I know firsthand that there's a tremendous problem uh, with uh, business email compromise, with fraud, uh, transfer funds fraud, um, you know, lots of things like this. Ransomware is, you know, still, still growing. Um, and a lot of that is because people don't know how to identify who they're dealing with online. Um, little research I did said that uh, in the world, there's about 7.6 billion people. About 1 billion people have no idea of any kind, whether it be physical or digital. About 3.5 billion people have a, an ID of some sort, a government ID, and then, but it has no digital equivalent or trail. And then another 7.6 billion people have an ID, a digital ID, and, and that's associated with a uh, physical ID. So it sort of shows that there is an opportunity. There's a need, there is an opportunity, and of course there's lots of various tools, and DNS is certainly one of those tools. You know, I think my definition of ID, digital ID, is um, one, you know, I've been building my 
online persona on my GitHub accounts, or you know, my other, my other, just but not my name. It's you know, my name is a different name on a different location on Telegram to GitHub to whatever. Um, I've been trying to rebrand the EDAD. So I have a father of three kids, so too many Chads out there. Everybody follows the crypto Chad or whatever it is. So finally, I changed, you know, for three years, it's taken me to EDAD rebranding. And so for me, I'm trying to go to the digital economy, digital world as a new identity under EDAD. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's taken a long time to kind of transition there. But I think that the human factor with the digital world factor is really interesting because now we have digital twins now. You have a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, technologies are coming up, um, avatars and stuff like that. And how does that human relate with the, the digital identity side of it? I think it's getting really interesting because you can kind of be your own persona, your own relationship. And so I think there's a big, big opportunity. Now, now going deeper with the domains, right? You know, like every domain is unique and every domain has its own well, word that usually represents something else. Um, how do we, I work with how do computers and humans work together and independently. So, you know, when we start getting to the level of AI and these other systems, uh, you know, do humans, you know, do humans represent a digital identity or the physical? I think we're in a really, really interesting period right now to where human identity and digital identity both merging together and then being identity is going to be a really, really um, a growth factor and domains fit into that identity factor where they can be their own identity. Um, you know, the humans, we own them and stuff like that, but, you know, how do we unleash them to become their own uh, entity? Uh, and, and her identity, and so, and the reputation, you know, right, like, um, <clears throat> my reputation is really based on my GitHub accounts or my other things that people can verify um, that, those credentials. So I think going forward, I think your identity really online is gonna be even more valuable almost than your word as a human uh, down, the, down the road. But oh, we're gonna talk about some use cases too, like, uh, like that's one of my use cases. Do you guys have some other use cases you wanna talk about? Yeah, I've had something on my mind for a long time. I think there's, uh, you know, obviously when the internet started, uh, bulletin boards, you know, electronic communications, it was kind of fun to have anonym anonymity, right? Um, you just felt like, you know, people you, you, people were, I mean, in some ways this was bad, but it was also kind of fun. You know, you, you felt more free to just really share your ideas, your thoughts and whatever. But as it's evolved, what I believe is that, you know, as social networks have grown and become more common, what's ended up happening is they've devolved to a point where today, a lot of the social networks feel to me like they're a mob. They're no longer a place where intelligent discussion happens. Uh, you know, if you try to have an intelligent debate or discussion, what ends up happening, you know, you might feel like you're making some points, you're maybe winning an argument, you're getting other people to see things your way, and then all of a sudden somebody comes out of left field and you don't know who they are, you've never met them, and they just say, hey, you're an asshole. Um, and it just, the whole thing turns into mob mentality. So I think that creating digital identities basically helps you to, uh, you know, if you know who you're dealing with, you can have more intelligent, more meaningful conversations, and you can come to better solutions. Because obviously we don't all want to agree, there's no way you make progress if you just all feel the same way about everything. Uh, but, it, but you do need to know who you're speaking with and if they can really stand behind what their, uh, what their position is. Can I build on what you just shared? So I look at there being two distinct use cases for domains. You have the traditional uh, use case, which is businesses. You create a website, you drive traffic to that website, and you generate some sort of e-commerce or service-based value to that website. Then I think about a second use case, which is what we're talking about today, which is more about using it as an individual, as your representation of who you are. If we go back to that first traditional use case for businesses, back in the 2010s, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg put out a pitch that you did not need a website. You could grow your entire business on Facebook, everything from managing customer service to e-commerce to awareness, all within the walled garden of their platform. And what happened was that worked. It worked really well for about 10 years. And then what happened is Tim Cook said, I don't trust you, Mark Zuckerberg, and I'm going to restrict the amount of data that you collect from people. And this was the iOS 14 changes. And through that restriction of data, what happened is, is that businesses realized they could no longer efficiently collect and drive traffic to their Facebook experiences. 
And so they started to shut off spend. And then they realized that the, their entire livelihood was in jeopardy because their digital identity as a business was tied to the whims of one social media founder. And so what they realized in that moment is that it was crucial to develop their own digital identity off of the platform. And you're gonna see, I believe, a rise in the creation of websites and the investment in domains, whether it's for domains for a front door, whether it's domains for a consolidated experience for their content that they're posting, whether it's domains for payable, you're going to see that investment in domains because it's about establishing agency control over your digital identity as an entrepreneur or as a business owner. So that's over here, that's in your traditional use case where I think we're gonna see that evolution. On the second side is digital ID at the individual level. So I am a person, I work at Identity Digital, I do not need a business website. I've got one, it's identity.digital, identity please go visit it, we're rebranding next week, it's gonna be great. But as an individual, why do I need a domain? And for me, what I believe is happening, if we go to another social media platform where I worked, Twitter, you see that Elon has really turned everything on its head with regards to verification. And so now, you can pay to be whoever without having to verify that you are actually that person. This creates a massive risk for the dissemination of misinformation. This creates a huge risk for businesses. This creates a huge risk for government. This creates a huge risk for everybody in this room if somebody can go in and pay $8 a month and claim to be you. And so what domains will do is they will offer a lever for any of us in this room to go out and harness our own digital identity and verify who we are through our own websites and then port that across all different platforms. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> uh, we'll expand on that too and we'll go down the risk and on the digital identity. I think there's definitely a movement to personalization of your identity as your name, right? Versus off of another network effect like that can be taken away from like Mark Zuckerberg. It happens, happens a lot. Um, not more to, uh, to me in general. And they use a female face on Facebook. Like, so um, in you know, one sense where you're trusting somebody else's platform and they can deplatform you for really nothing or hacks or something like that, it's real taking into your account to be your own identity. So you're starting to see that wave of people registering their, their names. Right? Because if you don't, well, it's, a, it's an aggressive market. Uh, one example is Tiffany Cuban with Mark Cuban's wife. Um, he dropped it, I picked it up, give it to him, but it's like, listen, anybody else can put like a virtual porn of your life on these images now. And so people are starting to do this. You just don't hear about it a lot, but you know, people like to mess with people. And this is one way to do that is to mess with your identity. Um, but what, you know, some, I want to go into some of the other security things from like, what are some of these risks, right? So we're dumping in these creating digital identities, but what are some of the risks you think with the identities, digital identities? Uh, well, you know, I, I would probably first like to say what are some of the solutions, right? Um, obviously, there's a lot. There are some uh, governments that are proposing uh, a form of government ID. I know, you know, some of the work I was looking at uh, recently. There's, I mean, on almost every level. In, at the UN, uh, even in the United States, uh, several European countries are looking at ways to connect your government digital ID with your, uh, um, you know, your, your uh, I'm sorry, your, your physical ID with your digital ID. There's certainly a lot of talk in the Web3 space, um, but I still think it's very Wild West-ish, I guess. There's no, I, I feel like there's a lot of people that have to uh, come together for it to work. I can already see some people don't agree with me, but my point is that uh, I, it, it has promise. I mean, blockchain is super awesome technology, and I, I, I really think there's value in being able to tie it, tie uh, finding provenance uh, that deals with somebody's ID and tying it back to, to reality. Uh, so certainly there is promise there. I'm not saying that it's not a good idea. I think there's great promise uh, in blockchain and how it can be used for that purpose. But I just think there needs to be better self-government, governance, uh, more uh, cooperation. And I think, you know, when you just leave it wide open, that, that that's a risk. Um, and, and that's something that they have to do amongst themselves, right? All the people that are involved in, in you know, uh, blockchain domains and all those types of things, that's something that they have to figure out. I mean, just like domains were Wild West maybe in the beginning, this is uh, a process that they need to go through. So, the, and all the cryptographic tools, there's certainly a lot of opportunities there. 
And, uh, and then there's you know, access management tools, keys, and other ways of tying real identities to, uh, to digital identities. I had a little conversation with Rich Shire from CIRA. They've done some real ni nice work up in Canada on how to connect, DN to use DNS to, to create digital identity uh, provenance. Again, being able to tie a person's identity back to their digital ID. I think risks right now are because we're in a time of disruption. So for the last 10 years, there was standard platforms in which people use domains, and now we're approaching a time of bifurcation. You have the bifurcation between Web 2 and Web 3. You have the bifurcation between centralized and decentralized platforms. You have different approaches towards payable domains. And so we have not established firm use cases and best practices for how the masses are going to engage with all of that. And whenever you have disruption, whenever you have bifurcation, there's always the risk that we enter into a phase that's not aligned with our interests or that more variabilities are engaged. And so for me, I, I think that if we're talking or we're advocating around people investing in their own domain names and really investing in digital IDs, are we potentially on a precipice where people can steal identities? And so that would be taking, to your point about taking names, and creating entire online ex experiences with that name before the person who owns that name gets there. Um, if I may, this happened to me, um, but it happened to me in the first round, which was Rachel Sterling is an adult film star. And um, she is rachelsterling.com. I am not rachelsterling.com. <laughs> I encourage you all to look her up on your not work computers. <laughs> And so I just think that that's going to happen tenfold um, as everybody rushes to grab whatever names that they want and really park their identity in certain parts of the internet. And I think if you think about it, um, you know, your name is your identity, right? And then there's Paul Smith. You know, there's there's a lot of Paul Smith. There's a lot of commonality, of exact match names of the humans. You know, the names. You know, my concern is like I think our social security numbers are pretty easily hacked now, right? And, and we are beholden to the government by our identity of our social security number, um, which is a very easy thing to manipulate or get. And once you get it, like what's gonna happen in that situation? I know we talked about here, like some people have probably got their stuff for social security numbers and you have to do all these other layers of things to identify with your IRS and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, the future, the government knows it's going digital. It's it is going digital, um, we don't know. <clears throat> and so how is the government gonna look at a digital ID from a policy, from a you know, delegation uh, uh, sort of factor? So what, what part of the government do we be holding to to you know, judge our digital identity? What do we, can we take upon ourselves as our identity um, and create our own value? Because I was a big proponent in you know, the uh, blockchain and stuff from uh, college students, like listen, you are your own currency. Like, like you create your identity, you create, and always invest in yourself. Because they can't take away your knowledge, your experience, and stuff like that. So you take it upon yourself to build your identity, your digital identity, and nobody should be able to take that away from you. Um, part of my risk is when we start using these other distribution platforms like Twitter, you know, we were building some of our businesses on Twitter to some extent, and then we find out that this got taken away. And so like in that, it's kind of, it's a really, really hard spell like, okay, I, I, you, you just realize, oh my God, this is not really happening to me. So I think a lot of people don't realize that it happens more than what you anticipate. And so in that case, you know, I'm leasing on my identity on somebody else's platform, and it's their right. You know, it, it's in a sense it's, that is their infrastructure. That is the right to theoretically do that. Um, but again, I want my own identity. I want to be able to feel protected. I want to be able to feel that nobody's going to take it away from me. Um, and I think that's what we need to kind of make sure we kind of button up or analyze from a general macro. Level. And I think what you're talking about right now is, again, agency. And so we had a conversation yesterday where we talked about the rise of Blue Sky and Mastodon and decentralized platforms. And there's this, when you sign up for one of these platforms, you are signing up with a domain. So you are not signing up with a handle on that platform that is not owned by that platform. It is your domain. And then that becomes really portable. And so nobody can take that away from you. So if we start thinking about distribution channels through decentralized platforms, you are able to pick up your domain pick up your content and port it to a different platform. And so again, really investing in digital IDs when we start embracing these decentralized platforms will allow people that portability and that flexibility to not have what happened to you. 
I'd like to step in here. Uh, this was the next topic. So, um, you know, for you guys that don't know on the technical stack, what she's talking about, the Jack Dorsey's of uh, Blue Sky is Twitter decentralized, um, decentralized storage, decentralized compute systems. That's kind of what's going on now is decentralization and using blockchain. So with that, it's called the app protocol. And the app protocol uses basically hashing, and, but the, form, the first form of identification is the URL. And so in one sense, we do, the, the Web2 centralization has its strengths and weaknesses with ICANN and VeriSign and that slow methodical, people want to make comments. But so in one sense, we have that, which is a strength and a weakness. And then, but these other decentralized protocols like the app protocol using them, they're kind of embracing that um, verification architecture. And so that's where with domains, they, they are, are gonna have another identity uh, purpose uh, as the first layer of verification for content distribution identifications. And so that is gonna be, I think, one of the bullish um, things for domains right now as a, as a new technical stack. And for me, talking to people in the Web3 space and the Web1 space, you know, domains are digital native assets. They can evolve, they adapt, and because they're digital native. And so while some of them count them out because they're web two domains, they're still digital native. And so you're, see, you're seeing them evolve and adapt now, you know, 27, 28 years later. Um, I'm still getting more invigorating, but, but by these new technologies that are embracing <clears throat> the architecture of how, it's, how it operates. Yeah, I'd like to you know just comment and emphasize that domain names are still the last best bastion of control for your digital identity. And I think it's important for people in, in this room who are invested in the domain name world to recognize that value. It's probably the one place where uh, you, you know it, it, it's really difficult for others to take away the work that you've put into um, uh, you know creating your. Uh, information, sharing your information online. Um, but I want to go back a little bit to some of the things we talked about earlier. I do think there is a place for an anonymity, um, but I also think that there should be a place for, um, you know, trueness and verification and, you know, reality. But I definitely think it needs to be voluntary. I don't want to live in a country where I'm required to always, you know, I'd like to be able to have the choice to be anonymous and to where I need to be when money is involved, when real, you know, when there's something at stake, that it's me, okay? And I can verify that and I can prove it. And then I also, if I'm on the receiving end, I can verify who is talking to me and who is dealing with me. If it's somebody that chooses to be anonymous, I may just choose to ignore it. And that's, that's that should be my right. Um, but I also think we need, we need, you know, both options, especially when we're on the receiving end of some communication, uh, because there are important things at stake. I want the government to be able to find me for my tax return, so. Especially if there's a refund. Do you want to talk about that No. I don't know where we want to go from next, but, um, you know, I think, like, time, right? Like, you can't get more time and so you're always like, how do you, how do you, you know, get more productive? You know, you can't find more time, right? So I think with now with digital twins, digital, whatever you want to call them, right? Like virtual avatars now, somebody created his girlfriend GPT now, like, and it's, it's interesting, right? So now he's creating a digital character of his girlfriend uh, and interacting with her during the day and stuff. So it's interesting to see where we're going with like replication, you know, like of our profiles and stuff like that. And so it's evolving really fast. So One you're other saying, wait, you're saying husband.gpt has not been created yet? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make a comment about that um, since that sort of plays here. I think transparency and communication is really important. So we, you know, we're, we're IT.com. We're talking about anything IT, but we're also talking about anything it. And I thought, hmm, what is it? You hear people in entertainment or, you know, uh, things like that, you know, they'll say, oh, that person has it. So I'm trying to think of what, what it is. And so I asked, I asked ChatGPT to, to write an article for me about, you know, the history of the idea of it and, um, and so forth. Well, it wrote an article that blew us all away. I mean, it was five or six paragraphs that talked about where this concept began. How, why do people say, oh, you've got it, or she's got it, or that's got it. And the article was just amazing and publishable. 
But I thought to myself, all I did was I wrote a little prompt. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking about how am I going to, you know, credit this? And and I came up with, you know, I have to say the article was written by ChatGPT, and I just wrote the prompt. That's really the truth of it. And I think if there's going to be any law about, you know, AI, it probably should be attribution and citation, because, uh, you know, I'd like to know that. I'm hearing from a robot or that I'm hearing from a human. And the truth is, it's not quite that easy to tell today. Uh, not today. I research this stuff like five, six hours a day. And there's some very, very good conversational AI um, that are training. Some of them are you know, very, very well intended for thera th therapies. And you can see it interacting, right? So you look for patterns eventually. But some of these are really, really good because it, it, it's an engagement, right? So. Look, I have three kids, and when they told me that uh, Instagram had a chatbot and they're interacting with the chatbot, right? You're, you know, you want to protect it because these are getting some of them are adversary, that are intentional, that are bad, uh, and some of them are good. And so they're already down into our kids' you know, Instagram stuff, and so it's already here. So it's not like it's coming. There, there are programs. We're not going to tell you about it, but they're so good already now. Like, what is? I think the human-to-human -human communication is going to be more value, like physical meetings like this. I think more than ever, because you aren't gonna know if you are or not talking to an agent that doesn't exist, uh, or, or its purpose, right, um, or its intention. But I can imagine, obviously after three years at home for COVID, we all love being back here together again. Some of us probably loved each other too much on a dance floor, but we all love that we're now together again. And I can imagine, as digital IDs become more prevalent, if we do business cards, it's just a QR code with our handle or our domain on it. And then it takes you to your online experience and that's where you can learn everything about that person. You know, you could take them to LinkedIn, you could take them to a website, but it's all about consolidating who you are underneath one domain and that becomes your calling card, that becomes your resume, that's how people engage with you. I'd like to take that from, um Identity, not again, not the human in the middle, but the you, what does the URL represent to somebody else? Like so, in the power of a domain, I think you mentioned power in China, right? They're like two letter because of power, and so you know when you have a name like I don't know, mergers.com, right? It's one of ours. Like our door opens. Like they don't know who's on the other end of mergers.com, but when you send an email to an MA lawyer, they open it. Like and so they open it because of the power of the URL identity. Right, that is just like those are facts, and so people that understand that, that's kind of the education. Like, listen, these are this is a door opener based on the identity that they perceive right off the beginning. It's how do you back it up, and what do you back it up with? Behind that, makes sustainability and good companies and stuff like that. Um, that's a little bit harder to do, but um, just more time than ever. The power of a URL portraying that identity is always the foot in the door, and that's usually the difference between success and failure. I want to mention, we, you know, we brought up QR codes. QR codes are becoming the next vector for spreading malware. Why? Because you don't know where you're going. I'm not, I've never been a fan of them. I think, you know, more people should use domain names rather than QR codes because at least you can see where you're going, you can type it in, you can verify it. Um, and again, that speaks to the power of the domain name. Um, something that's important. It's my ass a lot of times, right? A lot of hackers pushing stuff, right? You know, like it was eBay. I don't even know why these like Google and eBay have not monitoring the DNS like every day. Like it's you know, you know autos dash Google dot com two weeks ago, right? Okay, fly, 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 right? And so like you know that is the first kind of layer of protection. Is, you know these early names that are re recently registered and they're like phishing and stuff like that. Like um, you know, I think it's, it's a strength and a weakness to where I wish our industry or the industry would get even tighter on like new registration stuff, because it, it's really saved my butt. That's the first thing I look for is the string, right? Is like, do you trust this, not trust this? Uh, in, fact, in fact, when you're opening your email, you know, we need to teach people to look for the URL. There was a trend going back a few years where, and I think Facebook is doing this, they're trying to keep everything on Facebook. Google certainly tried to deprecate the idea of the URL in search results. And I think they even changed their mind back, by the way. Um, because the URL is valuable, it's a tool to protect yourself. And when I get an email that looks like it's a phishing email, the first thing I do, if I have any suspicion, even if I don't, I still like to verify, I'm always gonna click on the from, I'm gonna go a little deeper and look at that URL very closely, 
and I'm going to see if there's anything suspicious of, suspicious about that URL, then I know that that's not to be trusted. So we need to you know promote this because there is there are trends from big titans in the industry who want you know to own the internet. Let's face it, that's what they're trying to do. And the URL is the one thing. The domain name is the one thing that keeps us as end users as uh, as consumers, it gives us the ability to protect ourselves. Everybody knows what a, the definition of a URL is, right? I'm assuming, right? And if you go to Google, right, what do they have in their box? It's it, put in the URL, right? So if you look at the, U, the strings of how identity is being on the internet, it's usually through the URL. Uh, even blockchain companies are only go to this URL, right? So just the diversion of there to where you know, the power of the URL is going forward into it, not away from it, um, from an identity standpoint. You just look, you just look at, look at Google, it's right there in the box, look at, it, so I always look for the word every time I see the word URL, and I correlate, you know, digital ID with URL. Like most people maybe not do that, but I think those two are kind of really joined at the hip and from a standpoint. Did you want to take questions from the yeah, open it up, see where we want to go. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Topics you guys want to talk about? I have like three identities, uh, but they're on different platforms. I don't know why, whatever, it wasn't you know, intentional, it was just which one's available, pick it and go, and then once you get, once you build value on that identity, right, it's going off of it, you lose all of your credibility of what you built up on the identity, right? So I think the portability of digital IDs, or interoperability of digital IDs is an important topic, um, because again, if they're not interoperable, they can't communicate, you really can't get the value built on like GitHub versus Telegram versus whatever, right? So you're building these different identities on these different platforms. They're, they really are. Again, that's why I think the beauty of bringing it back to a URL, it is universal, right? It is, it is, it is composable. <coughs> Other assets can compose into you or wrap around you um, versus kind of the other way around to where, again, you're trusting your identity on these other systems um, to and hopefully you trust Brian, um, uh, with you know Coinbase and then too, um, so I think that's an important part is the interoperability of digital IDs, right? Um, as long as you can verify and you can maybe aggregate, and I think like Linktree and these other firms try to do that, right? Is bring you to a location and send you off to other uh, areas of your identity. But um, um, I, I'm more encouraged on the Blue Sky and the App Protocol because of that structure and Filecoin virtual. Machine is an interesting um, um, platform that they're doing, and they, they embrace uh, the DNS URL strategy um, on that. And so those are pretty powerful, smart um, infrastructure builders. Um, and so I think so I think that is aware, but I don't know if people really care about the interoperability between digital IDs right now. They're all trying to get their land grab, build a value proposition, um, but <clears throat> I have several, several. But so your question was divided into anticipated use cases and then multiple different IDs. And so let's talk about use cases first. Um, I think that e-commerce and the decision decisions around e-commerce typically drive use cases. And the reason for that is because if people have an opportunity to make money, they will change behavior in search of making that money. And so um, realistically, I think for domains, new use cases, number one, it is digital ID as social construct, like taking your handle from traditional social, and then making that for decentralized social, like on a blue sky, on a mastodon, and really taking and 
calcifying your personal brand across all of these different platforms that are going to develop. That's number one. Number two, it is payments. And as I said, it's about making money. I think that we have not yet landed on the um, agreed upon infrastructure of what that will look like. It could be pay.sld.tld, right? Or it could be your username, dot the platform, dot com. We don't know yet what that standard operating procedure will be for the structure of the domain for payments. And I think that that will probably emerge as a, an experience over the next couple of years as we just all start to gravitate towards one approach. People are trying to figure it out right now. I would say the third use case is around content aggregation. And so um, when I think about traditional social media platforms, the way that they monetize uh, any of these platforms is time spent on platform. The more time a user spends on the platform, the more ads they'll see, the more money the platform can charge. And so you as a user are a commodity to the social media platform. And so they constrict your ability to send um, viewers off platform through links. And so that's where the rise of Linktree and Link and Bio solutions have developed because if you want to make money as a content creator, nascent or established on any of these platforms, you need a digital front door to be actual to actually be able to merchandise. And so I think that content aggregation through the lens of e-commerce will become another primary use case of domains. So that would be digital ID, payments, and then content aggregation will probably be the three use cases. When I think about the second part of your question is do you anticipate multiple IDs? I get brought back to the fact that there are so many people on Instagram that have their Finstas. And the reason that people have their Finstas or their fake Instagrams is because we are not the same person to everybody. We might have different goals. So like at work, I am allegedly a chief marketing officer who knows what I'm talking about. At home, I am a baseball mom who like obsessively tracks my son's uh, stats like a crazy person. I don't know if those two personas belong in the same digital ID. I might look insane. And so there might be a way for me to become like at rachelsterling.bio on Blue Sky, which is my professional portfolio, and it might include a very you know well-framed picture of me sitting on this panel. But then there also might be baseball mom, you know, dot bio, or dot mom, baseball dot mom. Oh my God, I gotta go get that. Where I am just literally posting my son's stats. And I don't know, and that's the beauty of that. And so I think that we're just going to see a lot of different exploration of how people craft their digital identity. And for me, one of the things, if I may make a plug for Identity Digital, is that is where I work. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about our portfolio is we have so much creativity in all of the different TLDs. Um, and so you could be baseballmom.rocks, or I can get my son's name, you know, lucasbaseball.rocks. And like, I'm basically communicating to the world that Lucas really freaking rocks at baseball. And so that makes me excited. I love something that Rachel just said. She used the word calcification. And it's important to me when I talk to people or coach somebody about succeeding online, I like to uh, tell them that, you know, think of your domain name as your real digital identity. And think of the social networks, because social networks rise and fall, they come and go, they rise in importance, they you know diminish in importance. But your domain name is always your digital identity. And if you use the social networks and the traffic that you can bring to your domain name with that sort of that orbit around your domain name, if you treat it like that and, and don't give the social networks and all these other tools the, you know, the primacy, uh, give your domain name the primacy. Give your email list the primacy. Email is not dead. Uh, I mean, it's still a super important way for you to really bring home all the traffic that comes from the social networks. But that calcifies. And you know, if you want to chop a tree down, you have to hit the same spot. You can't just be chopping at the tree on every angle and expect that tree to fall. So when you think of your brand, when you think of your digital identity, when you think of your real identity, the fact that you're hitting in the same place, using the same name, the same moniker, the same handle, the same social network ID, all of that strengthens your ability to really rise in the digital world. Uh, but the home has to be the domain name. And we're really privileged to be in this room and to be part of this amazing industry. Um, and that's the truth, even though there's a lot of pressure from outside the domain world to diminish that truth. So. We've got something very exciting here. 
We have a minute. We have one more, one more question. They, they did announce something recently. Um, I haven't dug deeply into it. I, I think it's a very good trend, uh, but I don't know fully. Maybe, maybe you guys do know more about it. GoDaddy has launched payable domains. Is there anybody here from GoDaddy? Uh, no? Kudos to them on creating a subdomain mechanism, not very sophisticated. Um, cool utility that it offers to, but it's, not a, it's nothing sophisticated to put a subdomain as a payment channel on the subdomain. So uh, the announcement wasn't as big as like, this is a revolutionary paying for a thing. You just create a subdomain, got paid out, whatever on your domain, you create, put a Stripe payment system on there and you do it an hour. Uh, so uh, look, for me, from 27 years in the space, I wish we had more players uh, in the space evolving new technologies, trying new things, doing new things, but it's really not that big of a space. And so, we need people that are innovating, trying new things, testing new things, um, to really unlock the value of our potential of these assets. But kudos to them, but, um, you know, yes. Give them a little more credit. Uh, yeah. um, at least, I mean, to the average user, the guy that's coming out off the street to buy a domain and create payments, it's kind of cool to be able to do it simply. We, You understand what's behind it, so it doesn't sound like a big deal. But to an end user, it could be a big deal. So People, people want to make money. Right. If you give them the tools to make money, they will be happy. It's really that simple. Okay, any last talk just real quick? Any of the same thing left? Nothing except for I'm excited to still be part of the domain business, um, and I hope all of you are too. We're, we should be. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.